Seth, hello. Hey there, how, how are, are you? you? I'm good. <laughs> well, itch. You're sort you're of. you're sort of you're good itch. Yeah, I'm good. You know, it's that's the that's the standard reply these days, I suppose. That's about all we can be right now, <laughs> I think, is is, is good ish. That's right. Um uh well, welcome to uh, Tips and Techniques for Actors, Authors, and Storytellers. Uh, and uh, I'm so glad you're doing this. Um, and uh, I suppose we should start off telling people a little bit about who you are. Um, uh, you are an actor, director, author of uh, a book that we'll talk about in a little while and tell okay. people where they can get it. And... Uh, and co-founding co-founder and co-artistic director of the Barrow Group. Yeah, that's that's correct. I am indeed all those things. I'm also a musician, oddly enough. But uh, um, yeah, I'm doing all those things. But you know, primarily a parent, as you know, you know that yeah. as well. Well, so, that's yeah. all any of us are right now. Because <laughs> we're not allowed to leave the house. That's right. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, but, uh, tell us a little bit about your, uh, your origin story. How did you, um, find your way into this insane business? And also yeah. I just want to say to everybody who, who might be, uh, watching, we do have a few people watching, we have the chat going. So at any time, uh, pop in with questions. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I, uh, I grew up in Northern California. Um, I was, my parents were both educators, although my, my mom, uh, in the second half of her life, w moved into. Uh, she was a uh, an artist. She, her her uh, she worked in watercolor and uh, acrylics uh, and batik for a while, actually. And uh, so, so in fact, her, her work it was uh, it was. She never had a huge following, but she did have a following, and her work was sort of. I, I I always described it as flying Jews because it was it was sorry, it was very much influenced by Chagall and she always had like you know some some Hasidic Jew dancing kind of going like you know like stuff like that falling uh, off of the roof yes that's yeah, right, right. Uh, fiddler above the roof and everywhere else too right um, <laughs> and uh, but no she actually was a wonderful wonderful. And um, and I was, you know, they introduced me to theater at a very young age as an audience member. I would regularly go and watch plays, mostly at uh, ACT in San Francisco in the '60s and '70s. And and then uh, I I went to this high school called Tamil Pius High School that had, I would say, you know, arguably one of the best high school drama teachers that ever existed. I, I, I would kind of stand by that. I, I, you know, we, and I realized it later in life that he basically introduced us to kind of full conservatory training where, cause we would, you know, school would end around two and then we were just doing workshops like every day and in anything you can imagine, you know, improv. Well, we're going to have to match your high school drama teacher up against Phil Stewart, my high school drama teacher. Because you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they knew each other. Where, <laughs> so we, where was he located? He was in uh, Chappaqua, New York, and okay. he came out of Northwestern. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it's so you had a good experience too. In incredible. Yeah, he was yeah. a really incredible teacher, and we're still still friends, and you know, spend time. Yeah, chatting. that's that's amazing. Unfortunately, the uh, the gentleman that I say was a guy named Dan Caldwell, and he he got uh, Alzheimer's about. Uh, he passed away about four years ago or so, and uh, oh, was. Right was you know in dire straits for about 14 but okay. uh but anyway that that put me on the road and then i um i went to uh i graduated high school went to ucsc really to play frisbee i had no idea what the hell i wanted to do they have a good frisbee team they did yeah <laughs> they did i don't think i was good enough to make the team but i was good enough oh. to play every day oh. with, with players who were on the team wow okay so, um and uh and then I, I ended up, I took out time. I, I got um, what I thought was my big break because there was a, uh, this guy named Daniel Tam, who was an actor who had been on Broadway. And uh, he was in this play, Matter of Gravity with Catherine Hepburn. And he called me to ask if I wanted to play Puck in a community theater production. And in my mind, it was like, 
oh my God, Broadway's calling. And so I dropped... <laughs> I completely dropped out of school and and took off to Mill Valley, California to, you know, experience the bright lights. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I had that experience. And then I was kind of enjoying not being in school. So I was off for a while. But when I went back, I went to UCLA. Okay. And that's where I got a, uh, I minored in theater in uh, music and got a major, in, had a theater major. I was a theater and major. was it at UCLA that you discovered that you had not, in fact, been on Broadway? <laughs> um, I'm still, I haven't. <laughs> well, you may have now, but at, uh, at that point, well, you I've only quasi been on Broadway. I directed something on Broadway, but I have never, never been in a, in a show on Broadway. Um, but uh, the, uh, I'm not crying. I, I've, I've had a lot of fortunate stuff happen, so I feel very blessed. But, well, but you've, uh, played, you've played my husband. We in, or, in, or I, played in husband. Mine. I can never figure out how that, which was which. We played husbands. We were husbands. Well, you were the one with with the no. I, can I tell the story about the Novocaine and your you your? Can, uh, you tell the Novocaine story. <laughs> so you were playing, as I recall, you you your character had Bell's palsy. Is that yeah, is that yeah. right? Yeah. And and somebody had the 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 brilliant idea that that in order to portray that they they wanted to. Uh, numb you out is is that how they, that works? they asked me after after the table read i was approached by a second ad asking me if i was allergic to novocaine <laughs> and i said i'm not but now i have to call my agent <laughs> <laughs> and, and i guess agent. they were they were thinking that if if uh, they gave you novocaine that it would just like completely like well, I asked them that. I said, why were you thinking of that? Because people who who, who have been injected with Novocaine feel like they have Bell, Bell's palsy, <laughs> right. but they don't look like they have Bell's palsy. <laughs> right. And they actually said to me, well, we figured if we injected you with the Novocaine, then you would drool. <laughs> and I said, I said, I'm a trained actor. I can drool on command. Well, response. you you did take a drooling course. I know I did. Yeah, yeah, of yeah. course. <laughs> but anyway, yes, we were husbands, and I, and actually, I th I feel like we actually got to know each other mostly on the ride back. We took a bus ride back from the Hamptons. They were shooting it in the Hamptons. Yeah, and yeah. we well, just we tell out. people it was it was Margot at the wedding. If you want to see our our triumphant turn, it was in Noah Baumbach's Margot at the wedding <laughs> right. with, with uh, Jack Black, right. Nicole Kidman, and uh, Jennifer Jason Lee. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And so, um, and, and, and us. then, uh, yeah. So we, what'd you say? And us. I did. Oh, and us. Yeah, that's right. Well, <laughs> it was, and us, we have a special thing in the, in the credits, right? <laughs> as the husbands. <laughs> that's right. And, uh, but anyway, we, we hung out and we actually realized, I think that we had a lot in common. We had, we have two children that are the same age. Maybe both of them are the same age. Um, how old's your youngest? Uh, Abigail is 16 and oh, okay. Atticus is 22. So Atticus is exactly the same age as my son, Philip. And then I have a daughter, Rachel, who's, uh, she's 21. So a little, right. older. but you know, we, uh, enough so that we had play dates and got to hang out and became yeah. good friends. Yeah. So nice. So, um, so you and your wife, Lee Brock, also <laughs> a very accomplished actor and teacher, uh, founded the Barrow Group. Uh, which is a performance and teaching organization, correct? Yes, that, that is correct. Um, for during these times, the production side of our our the school or of the company is is shut down until we get to the other side of this. You know, we didn't. It didn't feel like we were going to be doing any kind of. Uh, performing in a situation where people were wearing masks or six feet apart or anything right. like that. So we're just waiting for what we hope happens, which is that a vaccine is developed and decim um, decimated and then it just, uh, and people can be in the same place together again. Right. But so you've, you've found a way to shift a lot of your classes online. So you're, yeah. still, you're still up and going and, and very much a going concern. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we, and, and that happened, it was like everybody it was immediate, you know, all of a sudden we had, I think we had coincidentally had one online class going in playwriting. Cause we had a, we have a playwright, a guy named John Yearly, who is, he lives in uh, Philly or just outside of Philly. And 
so he was teaching remotely and and then uh, this happened and all of a sudden we all were. And it's it's been a really interesting shift, as you know. Um, and for me, both uh, upsides and downsides, both. You had mentioned that yesterday. Let's let's talk about the, let's get the bad news out of the way first. And yeah. then we'll talk about the upside. Wh what do you feel is the the most difficult thing about shifting? Well, I mean, you know, a lot. You're, you're, first of all, even aside from whatever, work people do in terms of scene work or scene study or anything like that. There's just something that happens when you're in a room together where you can, you know, it's a human event. You can take each other in. Just communication is not in any way inhibited or compromised by the interface of, you know, Zoom or computers and all that. Right. And I certainly miss that. And, and there's certainly sort of for lack of a better word, energy hits that you get throughout the course of spending time together where, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not so singularly focused, you know, here we look at somebody and, and everybody's watching that same screen and that's where their attention is. Of course, if you're in, your, in a room, your attention can go wherever, it, wherever it wants to. And, and so that's weird. And of course, you know, for scene work, it, it's, you know, you're not touching people physically. Right. And, uh, and, certain kinds of physical interactions are, you know, very other than, you know, if there's a scene where people are kissing or there's a, there's any kind of stage combat or anything like that, that becomes it, you know, its own thing and different than what it is when you're really doing it. And, and so that, you know, those are the challenges for sure. Right. What you, you mentioned yesterday when we were doing our little pre uh, pre interview. Yes. Um, that that there were some things that you felt were better this way. They you are. Know, it, it, it's, a, it's a complete surprise to me. Um, and I've noticed it especially, when, well, there's certain, is a, the full thing is that there's certain kinds of, uh, you know, I have different students and, and different demographics of students. Mm -hmm. And what I noticed in, with my more advanced students who, and these are people that would come and, pretty much right. I mean, I offer and the school offers a bunch of different kinds of classes, but for the purposes of scene study, we have this, uh, a couple of groups that are quite experienced actors. There's people who are mostly as experienced as me, sometimes more experienced than I and, and all this. And uh, we were, you know, meeting together, doing this scene work all of a sudden on Zoom. And one of the things I noticed it was like, well, there are a couple things. One is it, of course, in some way emulates an aspect of film. Right. Because you're just, <clears throat> right, you know, you're just very intimate. I mean, you're you're just the same, the same way we're framed now as, like, you know, you're very close to people when they're doing their thing. So that was interesting. And then if you're in speaker mode in Zoom, it actually starts to operate almost like an edited film. I mean, obviously it's not carefully crafted editing, but anytime it's bouncing, you know, someone's talking, it's, it's shifting over to their close up. And, and that was kind of interesting. And then we started to figure out ways to, to work with zoom so that we're, we, that we weren't fighting the medium. So for example, when folks are doing scene work, nobody, unless it's direct address where they're talking to an audience, nobody looks at the camera or even their screen really. Right. And so what they do is very similar to what people might do if they're self taping, they, they, place in their mind, their person, you know, a little off camera, and that becomes an eye line that they can use or not. And then, so there's that. And right away, people would express and, and appropriately go like, wait a minute, I, I'm not able to really take in my partner visually as much. And, and uh, you know, I, I'm missing stuff because of that. And immediately when I was watching their work, I went, oh, wait, this is, there's a, there's an asset here. And I think what it is, is that I think as actors, so many of us, I certainly am, am this way, are hyper dependent on our eyes. And we have this tendency to feel like when we're playing that if I just really stare at my partner, I'll, I'll, I'll get some stimulus that will motivate me to do whatever it is that I do. And that's where the source is. And of course, in real life, if we walked around staring at each other all the time, it would be really creepy. <laughs> Yeah, I never look at my partner. <laughs> in, re in, re in rehearsal, I do, but once we get out on stage, it's every man for himself. <laughs> you once told me that 
your 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 acting technique was look towards the audience and make a wry face and just sort yeah. of say your line dryly. Yeah, say your line, make a wry face. That's, that's right. <laughs> but uh, um, but no, I I do think that I really do think that as actors, um, we're over dependent on that and that we end, end up engaging in behavior that is peculiar to life. It's just not lifelike. Right. And so all of a sudden I watched these people that were for, because of what zoom was and because of how the interface worked, they were encouraged to basically not do that. In some cases, people actually literally put pieces of paper over their screen. So they were having to do it all just by listening and, and doing whatever they were doing. And this freakish thing happened where I, these are actors that I've been watching some of these actors, you know, I've been playing with for 30 years. And I'll, some of them were all of a sudden doing better work than I'd ever seen. And I was like, well, that's just absolutely fascinating. Yeah. And, and that as that thing got in, as that got inhibited, all of a sudden all this other stuff came out and they, they ended up just taking in information in different ways. And so that, that's been one of the huge gifts that, you know, I never would have, uh, and then one last thing. I'm sorry, this is so long-winded, but there was one no, other gift of it. No, we're here for. The one one of the other gifts that I experienced firsthand. I was asked to uh, to participate as an actor on something that was just a rehearsal. It wasn't being broadcast or anything. And I noticed as I was playing, and, and I was uh, familiar enough with the text that I didn't have to be reading, you know, while I was playing. And I noticed that I felt. I, this whole thing about like being in front of an audience and being watched that even happens in on set with a crew, you know, you just like, Oh, there's people here. And it was gone. All of a sudden I was alone in my private space and I would get so relaxed. And I went, man, this level of relaxation is rare for me. And, and so that's another gift that if you kind of roll with it, you can get really loose. So those are, those are the two hidden gifts. Well, you're talking to the guy. Who, you're talking to the guy who twice has fallen asleep on stage. So. Me too. Wait, me too. Really? Yeah, I have to hear your stories now. In, fr in yeah. front of an audience. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it, it's a great it's a great feeling, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's it's a great it's a great snap, <laughs> but it's a horrible moment when you wake up. That's exactly right. <laughs> Waking up. Actually, there was there was one play that I was doing where I would fall asleep on stage, and it worked perfectly because. Um, my character tried to commit suicide at the end of the first act. Uh -huh. So in the second act, I the my first scene in the second act, I'm in a hospital bed in restraints. <laughs> and instead of after that scene, instead of wheeling the bed off stage, they had stagehands dressed as orderlies who would wheel the bed upstage and pull a curtain in front of it. Okay. And then I would be behind that curtain for about 15 minutes okay. <laughs> unseen by the audience and I would fall asleep. And, and then the next scene was with my wife uh -huh. coming to visit me in the hospital and I'm supposed to be drugged out of my mind anyway. <laughs> so it didn't matter. And it was actually in the crew's running notes. It said before scene three, make sure that Mr. Arkin is awake. So they would come out, they would they would gently shake me, and then they would turn back and roll me down. And Linda Geringer, who was playing my wife, would look at me and you know, on the nights where I had been asleep, she could tell. And she would look at me, and she'd be like, You son of a bitch, you were, you were asleep again. Well, okay, so I, 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 I was lying in a bed under hot lights. What are you gonna do? So I had a similar thing, but it didn't come out as well for me. I uh I was in a production of the lower depths at circle rep and there was uh, the way they staged it, you know, it's a flop house. And so I was one of the people that was a, uh, you know, an inhabitant of the flop house and we were supposed to be asleep. And the play began with people coming around. My, it might've been Lisa Emery actually who came around and woke me up and stuff oh, like that. You know, oh, my and, wife, <laughs> right. my strange wife. That's right. And, and so I fell asleep. But what happened for me was not nearly as as graceful as what you just described. What happened for me is the person who came around, I don't think Lisa, Lisa, I think it was the second person in the room. I think there was another guy, and I don't remember his name, who would shake me awake. And of course, I was always awake except this one time. And this time he went to shake me awake. And in an instant, I had absolutely no idea where I was, what was going on or anything. And I screamed top of my lungs, 
like bloody murder. <laughs> like the audience saw this, like this guy. Ah! Ah! Like, <laughs> <laughs> and and in a you know, in that millisecond, my brain is just going, Whoa, what's going on? And I was like, Oh my god, I'm on stage. <laughs> Oh, oh my was, god! It was horrible. Oh, so our mutual friend Jay Sanders just popped in, and oh. uh, what's funny is I don't know Jay if you were here earlier, but uh, Seth was talking about how he had one of the great uh, high school acting teachers, and I told him that uh, we would pit Phil Stewart against his high school acting teacher. Jay uh, is another student of Phil's. Wow, amazing. So uh, I'm out of, uh, I, want remind other, work. I want to remind other people, uh, anybody who's watching, that that uh, feel free to throw comments or questions into the chat for either Seth or me, and uh, we'll address your... Uh, Were you in Jay's class? I was not. Uh, Jay is, I, I believe, much, 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 much older than I am, I think. Uh, By years. Like, yeah. like, I think 20 or 30 years older. Yeah, now. I'm sure. <laughs> no, uh, I, I was, I was just behind Jay. I'm not sure exactly how many years, but enough years to, uh, be jealous because all I heard from Phil Stewart was about this brilliant actor, Jay Sanders, yeah. who, who yeah. maybe someday I would, uh, <laughs> Jay says I'm younger than you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> I can't be a ref in this because I'm 40 don't... years. He's 40 years younger than me. Um, <laughs> I also want to make sure that people know um, that you are the author of this book. And now you can see how old and dog eared my copy is because this is not the current edition. Of yeah, this. not at all. It's actually even a little different from the current edition. Yeah, yeah the current edition is, oh, I'm going to move it here. There, there we go. Uh, an actor's companion, and it's now called Tools for the Working Actor. And I, I believe now it has more than 99 bits of craft in it. No, I think it's the same number, but it's uh, I changed a few of them and, and just went in and, and, you know, edited it and hopefully made it better and, and stuff. And, uh, yeah. Um, Jay says Phil's still on his payroll. Still on his payroll, yeah. Uh, um. Oh, well, I'll have to send Phil a link to this conversation. Wait, really quickly. I mean, we're taking way too much real estate with this, but what was the other time you fell asleep? The other time I fell asleep was in a show called Little Footsteps at Pennsylvania Stage Company. Yeah. Um, and at, in the second act, I am in uh, my, my wife and I have split up before she has our baby and then she has our baby and it's madcap comedy. I break into the baby's room during the party for the christening because I'm Jewish and I want to do the Pidyon Haben, the naming ceremony. And uh, I'm in the bedroom alone and the, the baby's not in the crib. The baby is out uh, off stage, and uh, I hear somebody coming and I, I leap into the crib to hide. And I'm in the crib for about, <laughs> 10 about minutes, <laughs> for about 10 minutes during a scene. And then when my wife is left alone on stage, I'm supposed to, you know, <laughs> pop out of the crib. And the time came for me to pop out of the crib. And I didn't. Um, and what she's supposed to do when I pop out of the crib is start screaming at me and, and beating me. So I don't pop out of the crib. So she had to walk over to the crib and look in and see me. And of course, what she did is she looked in and she saw me and she started screaming and beating me. Yes. <laughs> That's how I woke up was being yelled at and beaten by Fantastic. my fellow actor because I was asleep in the crib. On oh, that's just so good. That was a bad way to wake up. That was yes, bad. Indeed. <laughs> nice. Oh, goodness. Um, yeah, this is um, clearly a way to get people to want to study <laughs> with, with you rather than with me because you don't want to study with the guy who falls asleep on stage. Except for that, that's what they get with me too. Oh, okay. The other thing that I do on stage, uh, probably much more than most people would enjoy uh, or would approve of, I should say, is I'm a pretty, I laugh a lot. Oh, you do? Yeah, I really do. Um, and I, it's funny because I generally, I don't know how to describe this, but I really enjoy even not just the experience of it, but I mean, I actually 
find that if you roll with it, you know, 99 out of 100 times, it's it's really a good thing. You know, it's just things get so unpredictable and you're so vulnerable and all that stuff. There's the occasional time when it's like just 100% inappropriate. There's no way around it. And that's not good. But well, and also if you let, if you often, usually if you just let, if you have that impulse and you let it out. Yeah, it goes away. Fighting it. Yeah. A, it goes away and it usually doesn't come out in an inappropriate way. Right. If that's the authentic impulse at that moment in the scene, oh, yeah. it might turn into a a wry laugh or a or a nostalgic or a sad laugh. And if yeah. you're trying to hold it in, it it almost invariably just turns into hysteria. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. Yeah. And I'm quick to point out, and and it's just tr been my experience in life that. <laughs> I often laugh at inappropriate times. I've, there's been so many funerals that I've laughed at and weddings and all that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. That's there's a funeral I'm hoping to laugh at. Uh, <laughs> I'm looking forward to laughing at someday. <laughs> Hopefully sooner rather than later. I can um, guess what that funeral is. but you know, exactly, um, you know exactly what it is. Don't want to alienate anybody. Okay. Um, I, uh, so again, any questions for... Um, for Seth, uh, throw them out there. I do want to ask, um, you know, I have, when I'm uh, teaching, I I have certain um, pet peeves, mm -hmm. which very clearly grow out of my personality and my, my background my, and my training, not just as an actor, but as an English major and as an attorney and th these things from my past that I bring to my approach as, as an actor. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I have these certain pet peeves with, with students, uh, ways in which I am demanding. Um, do you, what would you say are your one or two or three things that, that students do that, that you feel are, the biggest uh, pitfalls. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad you actually used that word because I don't, I don't find myself too much having uh, things that I would describe as a, as a pet peeve. Um, although I do feel like there's a misunderstanding and sometimes in the, in the approach that I'm sharing, so back to the falls, and then I'll explain what I meant by what I just okay, said. Could you repeat what you just I, said? I think that you, uh, you, the the uh, video stuttered for just a second. Oh, yeah. I said I was saying that I don't know that I exactly have pet peeves, but I definitely have things that I experience that are uh, pitfalls. Um, okay. And the, I think that a lot of times what, ha what happens is actors have learned along the way, whether it's from experience or from teachers or from just uh, working with directors on the job, they've learned to plan out all sorts of things. And of the, of the, you know, myriad of things that they make choices about or plan out or anything, I feel like some of those are useful and many of them are, are counterproductive and they're counterproductive in this sense is that, that, I can completely see it. It doesn't feel to me like I'm watching a person in real life. It feels like I'm wa watching somebody who's made choices about how they feel or, or what they think is supposed to happen precisely at a given moment or what, um, what their character's point of view exactly precisely is as if it was a finite thing or something like that. And I find that so much of what I'm sharing with people are techniques that are designed to help them uh, re release that stuff, basically. It short circuits their planning so that what happens is more spontaneous and more real and less just, uh, I, you know, I heard Alan Alda describe this brilliantly on that there was a um, American Masters series uh, about um, uh, Yitzhak uh, uh, Horowitz. I think that's, I hope I get the name right, the violinist. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's, very good friends with Alan Alda. And there's this one scene where they're having dinner and he's cook, uh, he's cooking for Alan Alda. And Alan not Alda- Perlman, Not Yitzhak Perlman? Yitzhak Perlman, that's it. That's it. That's, uh, that's what I wanted to ch check because my brain was telling me that's totally wrong. Um, so thank you. Um, 
And uh, so he's cooking dinner for Alan Alda and, and Alan Alda and him are talking about music and how every time he plays a note, it's, it's really new. It's, the, it's that time for playing the note. It's not like the other times he's played it. And he's listening to what is happening in that moment. And whatever happens, the interaction that he has as a, as a person and an artist with that note is of that moment very much. It's, it's, and Alan Alda said, yeah. And he said, well, first of all, he said to Alan Alda, he said, is it the same with acting? And Alan Alda said something to the effect of, well, yeah, it, for me it is. Um, he goes, there's nothing I hate more than watching actors do a report. Uh, and I took that as like, yeah, they've done all this work and they're just basically executing and showing you, you know, what they've done. Um, and I understand the, the temptation for the actor to, to, to want to engage in that and why they're drawn to this. And I understand the feeling of sort of confidence that it might, uh, fill them with and, and all this stuff, but there definitely is a downside. And so, so much of the technique I end up sharing with people are things that are designed to help them release their planning basically. Right. Uh, well, you, you, you use this word that we all use and that, that young actors or inexperienced actors, I think, misunderstand, which is this word of choices. You know, yeah. they all know they're supposed to make choices. Yeah. But those choices are not about what happens in the scene. No. They're yeah. about what happened before the scene started. Yeah. Most of most of them, I I think for me, I, yeah, I agree. What was my life? What I need to know everything that I that I can about my life and my circumstance up until the moment the scene begins. Yeah, yeah, I, and I, I and think I, about what's going to happen. Yeah, I totally agree with the notion of not of staying away from what's going to happen or any sense of you know that. Um, and I even I would even go so far just to build on what you said and may, maybe take it a step further that when it comes to building backstory or getting clear on what's happened, that there's only so much information we can take in anyway. There's no way that we can take in the level of uh, complexity and nuance that has gone into a real person's backstory. If I'm playing, you know, I'm 61 or I'm 60, I'll be 61. And if I'm playing, uh, you know, someone, there's no way I can match that 60 years of experience to give something that's that nuance and everything. So I think what we do as actors is we pick and choose. We just pick a couple of things that have happened and then we let our imagination, you know, run with it to whatever extent it wants to. But I couldn't agree more about it. like when you start to get it, get into the, like, here's what's happening in this scene. I, I feel like it's, it hasn't happened yet. And, yeah. and, and when it's happening, how, if you knew it was happening, that would be really weird. Uh, yeah. that would, you know, so yeah. I had an interesting conversation about this, uh, the backstory aspect of this with an actress I was working once on with on um, uh, a production of Lost in Yonkers. And she was playing Bella and I was playing Louis, her brother. Mm -hmm. and she wanted to have dinner one night and talk about the, the past. Yeah. And I said, I'm happy to have dinner. I don't want to, you know, we were out of town and everybody's having dinner. I'm happy to have dinner. I don't want to talk about what happened in the past. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? I said, because Louie and Bella don't agree on what happened. <laughs> and she said, well, I understand that, but I want to talk about what actually happened in the past. So it doesn't matter what actually happened in the past. Yeah. What matters to me is what I remember happening. Yeah. And yeah. what matters to you is what you remember happening. And that's all that matters. We don't need to agree on what happened in the past. Yeah. It tr frustrated her tremendously that I wouldn't share what I remembered about the past, but uh, as as I'm sure you do, I, I feel like the magic of that stuff is gone once you share it with another actor. It can be. I, I mean, I definitely feel like it's really important for us to pay careful attention to what what is helping and what's screwing us up, and and what frees us up, what locks us up. These are really important things, and I think it is a little different actor to actor for sure. I mean, there's I've met some actors that will do this kind of detailed dig into you know a biography of a character and everything that that would you know intimidatingly deep really and and it seems to work really well for them and then i've also met actors that do that same thing and it just their acting doesn't come off so great and and uh so i think we have to kind of learn ourselves and learn what you know what works and what doesn't 
Because ultimately, I think that's what happens. I think we basically get exposed to all these different ways of working, and then we assimilate it through our own lens and come mm -hmm. up with our own way of working, you know? Our own toolbox. Yeah. 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 I'm, totally. I'm, I'm always suspect of orthodoxy in another actor. Yeah. Because if I'm working with you and you're going to approach Neil Simon the way you're the same way you're going to uh, approach Chekhov, yeah, one of them's going to be really bad. One of them will be in the wrong language. I just want to get that off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, let's talk a little bit about. Uh, do you teach any audition classes, audition technique classes, or are you? Uh, I do sometimes, it, it, not a class that's, the, at, at our school, there actually are entire classes for specifically for film and television audition techniques and stuff. Um, I will sometimes fold that in when I'm doing film, film and television uh, teaching. Although it's interesting for me, like that's the one course as a teacher that I get the least enjoyment out of film and television classes. Um, and I realized that, you know, it's, I, it's and it's a very personal thing. I have so many peers who are superb teachers who, who you know, really enjoy that stuff. There's something about it that's there's the technical part of it is so rote to me. It's like, well, here's a few things to know, and I find myself. I think I have a really short attention span, so I, if I feel like I'm repeating myself too much, I start to, you know, doze off just the way I do on stage, and right. uh, and. Uh, but I do have, I do sometimes teach audition stuff for film. Yeah. Okay. Um, Crystal Mosley, uh, who's a former student of both of ours, I believe, um, made this comment. Uh, are these concepts that are taught at? Um, yeah, um, they might go by different names, but yes. Yeah, so she says there, she says she really loves the earliest moment to speak. And, but that's about as a technique that, um, and it doesn't matter what you would call it. Uh, sometimes I call it the impulse exercise. And, uh, but really what it is is that, you know, we get lines and they're, they're written completely clean. You know, a character has a line. There's another line by another character, another line by another character. And we see that and we start to play and, and we basically are just waiting for our cue and there it is. And then we talk and everything. And I find that real life is actually much messier than that in so many ways. Not only the result, meaning like we don't always speak cleanly. Sometimes we overlap, right? But there's also, we, we get information and it triggers off ideas for things for us to say. And often long, long way ahead of somebody's finishing what they're saying. I often will watch people converse back when uh, you could be on the subways and, you know, it was okay to do that. I would watch conversations going on down the bench where I, I couldn't hear what they're saying, but you'd see somebody talking and moments in the, the, the person that they're talking to is, is, you know, Nodding. doing this. Yeah. yeah. Just as you were uh, just a little, you know, bit of going the idea is that we kind of get an idea of where the other person's going. And, and so one way to kind of, uh, kickstart that as a player is to while you're playing, you know, you know your lines, but just while you're playing, be on the lookout. What's the what is the soonest uh, trigger for you to say whatever it is you have to say, and whatever you discovered in one go, like look for an earlier reason. Is there something? Is it? And it could come from anywhere. The idea could come from the room or something the other actor does, or just something random thought you had. Whatever it is. And you're just on the lookout while you're playing. And then the idea is that if it comes up, you take it within reason. In other words, if somebody has 10 lines to go, I'm not going to just start, probably won't start saying my stuff. But if so, I will definitely let them know as they're finishing that like, I, I would love to talk. I'm ready to start talking now. Yeah, that's right. right. So that's the, that's the earliest reason to speak thing. And it is, it is kind of amazing what it does. It tends to make things much more fluid less uh, compartmentalized, less like you're watching, you know, your turn and then your turn and then your turn. I am so stealing that. And then, and it's also, it's a, it, it, uh, it, if a director says to pick up the cues, to me, this is a great alt, an alternate thing to do. Cause I don't like thinking of cues, frankly. I, I don't like right. waiting for that. And now I can go and I'll go fast. Uh, so this basically preempts that. It's like, oh no, you're just looking for a sooner cue. And, uh, and so there's that. And then it also tends to, Oddly, it, it because there's something about it that's invasive, 
it raises the stakes of things immediately. It's just like you can you can just see people getting more flapped and 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 as a result more reactive and stuff. So that's what that particular one is. And well, it's also a doorway into something that I talk about frequently, which is that too often the actor is paying attention to the words on the page, which obviously I want them to, and they have to, but that's all they have going on. And I'm always trying to convey to them, you know, the words that you say are floating on top of the 10 things that you're not saying yeah, or the other things you're thinking about, the internal monologue that's going on while you're listening yeah, and while you're talking. Yeah, <laughs> that that's right. I, I had a teacher, uh, Michael Gordon at UCLA, who used to say, the words are the tip of an iceberg. Uh, and he would also say a similar concept, the words are the, are the byproduct of an entire life. And I, I think what he was attempting to communicate is it's the tiniest thing. And it's just like, like, like all these words that are spilling out, this would be the most long, boring monologue written down. But, but uh, you know, that's not, not really what I'm seeing or thinking about or any, anything like that, you know? I, I noticed, I noticed you're not <laughs> about any of this. What, what, are you, what are you eating after when we get off of the... That, th my mind didn't go to that curiously. Really? But it, it, it did go to your glasses, which I, I was enjoying. I like your glasses. You like these? I'll send you the link for them. They're, uh, I think it's, um, I think it was four for twenty nine dollars. They're anti. Oh, they're, re they're readers. They're cheaters. Uh, uh, very comfortable. I got got get them from Amazon. I graduated out of those about probably five years ago. I I, I have the full time deal. Oh, the full time. Yeah, I yeah. think I I think I may need them. No, I remember about 10 years ago, my mother saying to me, oh, just buy a multi-pack and leave them all over the house. And I said, I will never do that. I will never be that person. So how long have you been buying multi-packs? I'm that person. Yeah, yeah I was going to say. years now. And they're just all over the house because um, uh, otherwise I'm always just wondering where the hell my glasses are. The um, just to tie up a loose thread, the other exercise that uh, she was referring to, I think, is the conversation exercise, which I've heard introduced in so many forms by so many different people. There was a I was watching an interview with uh, Dustin Hoffman and and um, Robert De Niro when they were making Wag the Dog, and I guess Barry Sullivan uh, would uh, use this technique. It's the same technique where the idea is that sometimes when when we when we act, we start doing something different than when we're just living. And so one way to to address that is just talk about anything uh, outside of the text in rehearsal or whatever. And you're just talking. And then when you're in the middle of talking and you're on a roll, then you kind of slip into the text and start using the words from the thing. And usually right then and there, you'll notice if something changes, if something yeah. changes, like, oh, oh yeah. And so it allows you to kind of key in on it. And then you go like, yeah, I'll just let go of doing that different thing. So that instead of trying to make your acting a certain way to be more like life, it's sort of the reverse. You're, you got real life going on. You start to act, you go like, I'm trying to do something when I act, I'm keying in on that. I'm going to let go of doing that and see what happens. That's the conversation exercise. When I was at HB studio, um, uh, Uda assigned me uh, a scene from the bachelor party, the Patty Chayefsky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Teleplay. Yeah. When and, did you uh, study with her, Matt? We must have, because I studied with her too. I'm wondering if we overlapped. I studied with her from uh, about 89 to 94. Oh, okay. Four. Much later. Okay, yeah. I was very angry. Um, uh, and uh, and the, the particular scene that, that I was doing with my partner took place on a subway. Mm -hmm. And we said to each other, we, we said, let's rehearse on the subway. Mm-hmm. And we rehearsed on the, we said we were going to rehearse on the subway until we could do the scene and nobody would look at us. Yeah, yeah, right. Because it, when we started rehearsing on the subway, the minute we started rehearsing, yeah. everybody in the car was like, look at those two jerks rehearsing their scene. They're obviously <laughs> rehearsing a scene for an acting class. Yeah, yeah. The, you know, and we got to the point where we could run the lines in a pack sitting next to each other in a packed subway car with strap hangers, you know, standing yeah. there with their newspapers and we could have the conversation and nobody would look up. Yeah. Yeah. And we thought now it's ready to bring into class. Yeah. Yeah. Because now we're just talking to each other. Yeah. That's, that's, that's interesting. And there is that instant thing of now, you know, Oh, they said action. Yeah. 
That's when, right. When they said enter. And I, there was another funny story about that it was one night I, uh, I went down at about one o'clock in the morning downtown. My father was shooting um, uh, the film with um, uh, Chris Walken and Al, Al Pacino about the, uh, I'm forgetting, stand up guys. Okay. And it was a scene, uh, they were shooting in a, a, a big apartment building downtown LA all night. And, um, the scene was the three of them entering into a little apartment and there was a lot of physical business that took place in the little apartment. So every time they did a take, everything had to be reset for a mm -hmm. few minutes because they entered, looked at stuff, moved stuff around and left. Yeah. Um, and there wasn't enough. And so I'm sitting down in video village all the way at the end of the hall and they're at the other end of the hall and entering into the apartment and then leaving the apartment at the end of the take. And somebody said to me, do you want some earphones so you can listen? I said, no, I just want to sit here and watch. So I'm, I'm looking straight down this hall at the three of them every time they're off camera. And the three of them are standing there shooting the shit in the hallway. And then uh, Fisher Stevens would call action. And the three of them would walk into the apartment and I would start watching on the monitor. And you couldn't see any difference in yeah. anybody's behavior. It was still three old guys having yeah. a conversation. Yeah. The only thing that changed was that at one point they're standing in the hallway telling jokes or talking about what they, you know, when are we going to go on break? Or, you know, yeah. where's that, where's our cappuccinos? Uh, and then the next minute they're saying their lines. There's no difference energetically, physically, emotionally of any kind when yeah. action was called. Yeah. And it's extraordinary to watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's to me, that's the whole deal is like when, when, uh, and, and it's that there's this objective experience too. I mean, every once in a while, you, you, without, I mean, I, I never for a moment believe like I'm the character, I don't exist, you know, like I don't think that that, that happened. I think that we'd be insane if that happened. I really yeah. do. Um, yeah. That said, there are moments sometimes where I'll just go, well, I know I'm pretending, but man, this feels real. Uh, yeah. The, the the conversing part of it, you know. Well, and Uda, Uda would talk about that because where, yeah. where, people would say, "I don't know. I, I, it felt. I thought it was really good, but you know, I I I I, I don't think it, it couldn't have been that good because I didn't. You know, I always knew there was an audience there, and Uda would say, yeah. "Well, of course you did. You're yeah. not. You're not psychotic. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I it's think there is the awareness of it. It ceases yeah. to be your focus." I think it's very common for a lot, lots of actors, especially younger actors, to feel that if I was really dedicated and I really did the work properly, all of reality would go away and I could really live inside this character, and, you know, and which, uh, you know, is an anathema to me. And, but I think when I was younger, I thought that too. I had a, my girlfriend in college uh, once told, she was playing, I don't know, she was in some play and she came back one night, she said, oh my God, it was so good. I, I saw the staircase. You know, she was referring to like like imagining seeing the staircase that was in the internal reality of the story or whatever. And I was for I think for a couple of years I thought like I'm not as I'm not as good as Amy because I I am not seeing the staircase. I think wow. it's a big problem. What, what's Amy doing now? She's actually an actor and works all the time. She's she's one of the stars in the Bay Area in San Francisco. She's well, super there smart. You go. So. But I don't know. I I you know I haven't talked to her about that. It'd be interesting to see if she still stands by seeing the staircase. Seeing the staircase. My guess is she'd go like, yeah, that's all bullshit. <laughs> that's going to be my new my new yardstick for actors after a performance. <laughs> did, you see the staircase? Did, you, did you see the staircase? That's right. I was going to put it on my on my gravestone. I saw the staircase. <laughs> I finally saw the staircase. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There you go. Um, To, you, there was a story you were going to tell about the Margot at the wedding kickoff party. Oh, that's right. It was uh, it was this real, one of those huge foot and mouth moments. I, I was there was a kickoff party where uh, like the equivalent of a, of a rap party, which and I'm not I'm not familiar with the tradition of kickoff parties. I mean, I've, at this point in my life, I've done a fair amount of film and television. I don't I haven't been invited to many of these, but this was definitely like everybody in the cast and and i had asked you the other day if you were, you were there and you didn't recall being there so i was not there um but you know they clearly invited the cast and and uh 
the crew or the key members of the crew anyway to be there. And it was at a party at, um, at uh, as it turns out, it was Ann Roth's house. And I had no idea who Ann Roth even was. I just, it just wasn't a name that, you know, I was familiar and for our view, for our viewers. She is. Ann Roth is a producer and designer. She's a costume designer. Who's probably, yeah, she's, she's, I can't, I mean, she's both in theater and film and, and I don't, I have no idea how many awards she's won. It's got to be, you know, one of the, she must be one of the most award-winning designers, I would think. And she's, she's just, you know, at the core of our business in so yeah. many ways, artistically and also producerally. And so I don't, for some weird turn of events, um, it's there, this sort of pod formed of a conversation with um, Mike Nichols, Noah Bombeck and me. And of course I had nothing to say. <laughs> so I just sort of, I just sort of, you know, sat, sat there and nodding my head listening to them. And I was like, yeah, yeah, you know, like that kind of thing. And then into the circle went uh, Ann Roth, but I didn't know who she was. And I, so I just said, so um, I said, what are you, are you working on the film? And she said, yes. And I said, oh, great. What, what do you do? She goes, well, this is my house. And I said, oh, okay. And, and what do you, what do you do for the, for the, what do you, are, do you, are you, do you have a position on the film or something? And she goes, I'm Ann Roth. And I said, oh, okay. Um, Who are you? <laughs> like and, I, and I completely let her know nonverbally that I don't know who that is. And it, it did not go well. She was, <laughs> she was not pleased with that, uh, that interchange. It was Well, just, maybe this will make you feel a little bit better in terms of how that organization is run. Uh, this is my Noah Baumbach launch party story uh, before uh, Margot at the wedding where we met. I was cast as one of the school teachers in The Squid and the Whale. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, about two weeks before they started shooting, uh, they rewrote the script and combined two of the teachers into one. Yeah. And I get a call from my agent that this has happened and you're not in the movie anymore. I was like, okay, you know, that's, that's showbiz, literally. And um, about a week later, I get a call from a, uh, a PA uh, scheduling my uh, wardrobe fitting with Ann Roth. And I had to say, oh, uh, thank you very much, but uh, I, uh, I'm actually not in the movie anymore um uh they, they rewrote it and my character's been oh my god i'm so i'm so sorry so i'm so no no problem it happens then a few days later i get a call inviting me to that kickoff party for the squid uh, and the whale from another pa and i have to explain yet again that i'm no longer in the movie at which point i called my agent I tend to have to call my agent about Noah Baumbach movies. I called my agent and said, if they call me one more time, they have to pay me. <laughs> they, have to put me in the movie. they have to put me back in the movie. If, okay. uh, if they call me again, I'm, if they call me with, if they give me a call time, I'm showing up. <laughs> I'll be there. This, this business is so crazy. There, there was a, there was one year uh, is a phenomenal year where I had, seven jobs in a row that I was either cast in or quasi cast in, I can explain that, that fell through after being cast, seven in a row. Wow. And, it, and, and it, was, it was absolutely, it was just absolutely crazy. I, I just awesome. couldn't even believe that it was happening. And the, the last time it happened, my agent uh, you know, called up and they said, okay, they booked you on this thing. And they said, Seth, there's no way they can cut you from the movie because it is literally the pivotal scene in the whole movie. The entire plot rests on this plot point. There's absolutely no way. And I was like, okay, well, that's good. And sure enough, like the day before they shot, he goes, you won't believe it. It's like, oh, I'll believe it. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> they, cut, they cut the scene. Oh God. Yeah. Uh, I have a friend who turned down a role in Lincoln. Yep. Because it was too tiny. Yep. It was three tiny little scenes. Yeah. But then Daniel Day Lewis decided the movie had to be shot in chronological order, that he couldn't do it out of order. Okay. And if my friend had 
done it uh, because you know the ad drop rule yes, they can yes. drop you once but they can't drop you yes. twice yes yes would have he would have worked for three days yeah but would have been paid for something like 10 weeks yeah yeah i had a bunch of friends on the film uh in and out i don't know if you remember that film and uh, yeah, a, that, I love uh, Zach Orth and all those all those kids. Yeah, in that movie, it's a, such a great movie. And I had a friend that had like two lines in the film, but got paid for, and it it like shot over months and months and months and months. And one of the kids, one of the high no, school. He, no, he was an adult. He was like just one of the one of the people in the in the uh, you know the, the high neighborhood school? family. There was some kind of like they would have these family gatherings, and he would right. be there. And uh, it's an actor, Larry Clark, and uh, he just lived off of that film for years. You know, yeah. what a dynamite cast is in that movie too. Yeah, Lou Stad, you know, Lou Stadlin is in yeah. it. It's just really terrific, terrific cast. Yeah. Um, uh, so tell us a little bit more. I'm sorry, we sort of skipped over your book there. I brought it up, but tell me what's going on with that. How yeah, it's so, and so, where people can get it. Yeah, and I'm going to put a link just so everybody watching knows that there will be a link in the description to this once this video is posted, where you will be able to uh, go buy Seth's book. Yeah, I mean, the easiest way, frankly, is to just Google it on, on uh, Amazon. Amazon. Uh, it's uh, An Actor's Companion, Tools for the Working Actor by Seth Barish. And uh, Anne Hathaway did the forward for it very generously. And um, it's been published in this form for now about, gosh, I feel like it's been out eight, eight to 10 years in this particular version. And wow. uh, I've, got to, I've got to get myself one of the new ones. I'll send you, I'll send you one, of course. Oh, I, yeah. I, I, uh, I'm happy to. And, uh, and so, yeah, that's, that's the best way to, to find it. And it's been, uh, you know, the, that book is formatted in a way that's, uh, for practical use. So each chapter is very short. I, I articulate in the book, and it's just true. You heard me say it once today, actually. I do have a very short attention span. And I read this book called About Acting by Peter Barkworth, who was an actor in the UK, that unlike other acting books, had was formatted in this way that had these very short chapters that were just succinct and right to the point. And I appreciated it so much. And I thought, gee, if I ever write something that's a, you know in the realm of an acting book, I, I'm, I might wanna use that kind of format. And so I, I did, I built on it. And like every, you know, generally each chapter is, is a page or less. There are a few that for understandable reasons needed to be, be five, six pages, but most yeah. of them, I would say, you know, of the 99, 94 of them are just these short little things. And then at the end of the book, as if that wasn't condensed enough, I decided to condense the entire book into a six page reference sheet with, that just has the title of the chapter and the tool that I'm sharing uh, and the page that it's on if you wanted to access it. So that, and the idea was that if you're on the job and you just kind of go like, Oh, I'm, I'm trying to remember one of those things. You could just kind of go through this index and find it really quickly. And, and well, I actually, I actually carry that in my back pocket when I'm on stage and refer to it sometimes. No kid, that's so. I'm, I'm honored by that. That's, that's great. And that's what I mean. That really was what it was designed to do. And, and, uh, it's, it's pretty crazy. Well, you know, you know that great story about uh, Ralph Waite. Uh, I think at George Street Playhouse. No, uh, where he was doing a play and. Uh, in his uh, costume, I guess he had an untucked shirt in, in his costume, and he would stand in the wings with his script, looking at his script, and then before his entrance, he would tuck his script into his back pocket and walk out on stage and do the scene. And the story goes that one night he was out on stage and there was a very, very long pause that was just going on and on. And so he reached into his back pocket, pulled out his script, and looked at it and then said, nope, not me, and put it back in his pocket. <laughs> I don't know if it's true, uh, but it is one of my favorite stories. That is a fantastic story. And did I mishear, were you saying that you used my book literally on stage, you were saying? Is that what yeah, you I, I, Just the, that last reference bit so that if I get confused in a moment, I'm not sure 
how amazing. I play something on a given night, I, I pull that's it amazing. out. I totally misheard that. I thought you were saying backstage because I actually no. have some friends that do that. And uh, yeah, that's a, that would be pretty crazy. That would be great. Yeah. No, but I do use your book because um, I teach a directing class down at Chapman University. Mm -hmm. And I have used your book in that class um, as a way to spur these students who are who are coming they're film students they they, yeah. they haven't acted they haven't worked with actors right. and uh, i really praise chapman university for having this particular course which is really designed to to acquaint film directors with the idea that actors are not props right that that we have a process of our own and the more you know about our process yeah the, the better you're going to be as a director. And it's the same thing uh, I try to acquaint my acting students with. And it's why I have on this show, I have guests from other disciplines in film and theater, because the more you know about the jobs of the other people on the set, the yeah. better you're going to be at your I think job. You mentioned you have a guest coming up who's a cinematographer, right? Next week, yeah, I'll talk about that. Last week, I had a fellow who's a sound uh, a sound mixer, and you know, uh, and that episode is up for people who want to hear it. Uh, Bo Baker, who worked on he worked on Blade Runner and uh, Lady Hawk, and he's been on Grey's Anatomy for the past twelve years. And I actually, it's a very sad story. Bo had to leave to another job right before the tear, the famous tears in the rain line from Blade Runner. He wasn't there for- Wait, I don't know this story. What's the tears in the it's rain? It's just a famous line from the, from the movie where oh, okay. uh, Rutger Hauer says something about disappearing like tears in the rain. Oh, okay. Um, and he was, it's the iconic line in the movie and- And he missed he it. For it, um, and the, when I brought that when when I brought that up, I said that's so sad that you weren't there. He said, "Yeah, well, but they had rain machines going like mad, so they had to ADR the damn line anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it doesn't matter." Um, and uh, oh my yeah. god, that that I'll, I'll tell the story really quickly. But um, when you talked about sound, have you ever been on sets when the sound is just so god awfully loud that? you figure like, how are they going to even do this? Oh yeah. 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 I, I, I was, I, I did a, this is a, I'll try to tell the story really fast, but I, I got, I'm not, uh, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> well, I, I, I was, uh, I auditioned for the post, the Spielberg movie. And yeah. it was one of those things where you go in and they gave you, a, they gave us a bunch of like a bunch of different scenes that had a couple of lines each, you know, cause I guess it's just, there are going to be so many characters. So I auditioned for this thing and, and uh, I clearly, I just didn't get it. I didn't hear anything. I was like, all right. So months go by and I hear it's in production. And, and then I, and I know it's like about two weeks into production because I just, I just sort of knew that I had some friends in it and I knew that it was going on. And I get a call from my manager at 10 PM one night. And uh, she and I think it was a Sunday night. And she says, here's a weird one. And I went, okay. She goes, you remember that Spielberg movie audition? And I went, yeah, I, I, I do. And she goes, um, they wrote a new scene with that's, that's wasn't in the script. And it's a scene between uh, Meryl Streep and two guys. And it's this extended argument that they get over to, and uh, they want you a, a, to be one of them. And I was like, oh, okay. That's great. Well, when does it shoot? They said tomorrow. I said, well, what time tomorrow? They said, um, like your call would be six in the morning. And I said, okay, all right. Well, sure. Um, do they have size or anything? Well, they they don't want you to see the script. And so I was like, okay. So I get there, and there's this other actor, a guy named Clark Thorell. I don't know. Do you know Clark? He he's he's, he's an he's an actor who's been around for a while, and and. Uh, He's a musical theater actor primarily. And he was the other, uh, you know, he was the other guy. And and he's like, when did you get this call? And I said, like 10, 10 p.m. last night. He goes, that's when I got called too. And I went, well, clearly they just wrote this. I said, you know, so here we are, whatever. And we had both had instructions that we're supposed to, when we get the scene, we're supposed to learn both lines because they don't know which of the two parts they're going to have us play, right? Okay, great. Wonderful. Um, so we both learn each other's lines and we'd like, you know, it's like, okay, let's do it now. And I'll do it. We're just running lines with each other back and forth. 
playing the different parts. And we uh, we get you know dressed and everything, and they take us over to the set. And as soon as we get there, one of the PAs comes by and goes, uh, just so you know, we're um, we're four hours behind. So, you know, we'll try. And, and we're like, okay, whatever. And in my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, this scene's going to get cut. There's just no way that, you know, they're going to. And, uh, and Clark, who's had, a, I think he had done a little less film and television than I, and he was like, do you think it means that we're still in it? Do you think? And I was like, well, you know, I don't, I don't know. We'll see, you know, and everything. So as the day goes by, it becomes clear that, you know, it ain't going to happen. And just as we're leaving the, the, uh, this, one of the, ADs comes up to me and says, so here's the deal. Uh, we are going to shoot this scene, but not today. We're going to shoot it in two weeks and we're going to shoot it at the post and where they print. And uh, that that's that's what we're going to do. And I was like, okay, great. You know, So two weeks go by and now it's the night before and I haven't heard anything. So I call my manager and I say, do, do, uh, is this thing happening tomorrow? And she goes, I haven't heard anything. I, th I think so. And I went, well, I really, I mean, usually they, the contact you with just like fittings or something. And, well, and uh, to to DC? Say, no, no, no. It was in uh, in New York, in the boat. Oh. And so, uh, so it's now like 7 p.m. the night before. And I get a call mm -hmm. from uh, one of the, one of the second ADs. And, and, and he says, uh, so yeah, we're shooting tomorrow. Just want you to know. And I said, I said great. They said, yeah, but there's a little, it's a little change. Um, have you seen the scene? And, I'm like, and in my head, I'm like, well, this isn't, this isn't good. I don't know what this is going to be. And so I said, no, I haven't seen it. He goes, yeah, just, uh, you know, look at this, look at the sides and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. I was like, okay. So I look at the sides and I'm, and I'm, scanning through them and the scene that we were looking at was gone it there's now some scene where it just says like copy man or something like that and and there's like one line or maybe two lines and i go oh geez uh okay whatever it's spielberg i'll get to see spielberg work and yeah i'll right. sign with the spielberg movie so i show up on set and i'm uh clark is there and i said I said, so Clark, so what happened? And he goes, he goes, I don't know. They they just cut my scene, the scene, you know, our scene, and they never gave me another one. And in my head, I'm thinking, this is not, this just doesn't bode well. And for Clark, and so they they, you know, get hair and makeup, and then I go in and I'm second up. So I'm I'm in there and I walk into the set, and the set are these printers at uh, the the post office, and they are four stories high each of these printing machines they have literally parapets around them and they're going at full volume you know whack, whack. i mean you couldn't hear anything you had to shout to get anything done so the um first ad comes over to me he goes hey, he's from uh australia or new zealand and he goes seth and i went uh, <laughs> yeah and he goes have yeah. you met steve and i went um no i haven't and he goes come here and then uh, we kind of go through this thing and he taps on, you know, the back of somebody who's around my eye and turns around and it's Spielberg. And Spielberg is like, you know, as far away as I, it looks like I'm away from you on the frame. And, right. and he goes, hi. And I went, hi. And he goes, what's your name? And I said, Seth. And he goes, Scott. And I went, no, Seth. And he goes, oh, Seth. Okay. And then he turns around. And so the first thing he goes, Seth, go up there and climb up there to the parapet. And so I climb up this ladder to this thing. And then he comes over to me and he goes, what we're going to do is a camera rehearsal. And what you're going to do is you're going to run to the end of the parapet and the camera will swoop down and you're going to say your line. And I'm like, okay. And I have this line that, that I'm supposed to say. So, you know, camera rehearsal action. And I run to the thing and this camera swoops right in front of my face. And I say this line and, you know, they, and then one other line and then cut. And then the first lady comes running out. He goes, uh, Sith, uh, Steve wants to say something. And, and so Steve Spielberg is, is walking out and he's kind of looking at the ground and he looks up at me and he just goes like, you know, gestures at me. And I, and I go, yes. And he goes, Seth, say, and he gives me a different line. Right. So I'm like, okay. So I have this new line. Okay, great. Camera rolls action. Do the same thing. Look down. Spielberg's walking out, looking at the ground, looks up, goes, Seth. I go, yeah. He goes, also say and gives me a different line right so i'm like okay and so I'm like that does again same thing happens again and i now have four lines just like in my head i'm like kind of like trying to remember them and like okay i'll be fine i'll be fine i'll be fine and everything and then spielberg walks back in one more time and looks up at me and i go yeah and he goes 
Seth, say it really fast. <laughs> and my brain just goes, poof. It's like I got nothing. <laughs> I can't remember a single thing. And I hear, and he goes, let's shoot one. And then I, I'm like, oh, fuck. And then oh. my brain, and then I look around and I look at all this, you know, this printing noise. And I realize there are thousands of newspapers being printed for this shot. This is like one of the most expensive shots ever. And now I'm like, I can't remember anything. And it's the most expensive shot ever. And I hear action. And I just run to the edge of this parapet. And this camera goes like, whoosh, like that right to my face. And I just went, da! Fuck me! <laughs> and that was my debut with Steven Spielberg. <laughs> oh my god! I was talking to my younger brother the other day, where he he had I mean not the other day, a little bit pre-pandemic, where he had come from doing one day on something. Yeah. And uh, and I said to him, and I try to convey this to my students. I say, you will never have a harder job. Yeah. Yeah. In one day yeah. on, on a show yeah. because you show up and there's a hundred people and it is a well-oiled machine and there's only one thing that can go wrong today. And it's you. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, and, and, and I, the good news is I think most directors and most savvy actors know that they, they, they understand that it's much harder to be a day player than it is to, have one of those bigger parts. And stuff. Yeah, well, someday I'll tell you my Chris Noth story and what he did to me on. Uh, oh yes, I would like to hear that. Yeah, uh, I uh, it, it, we had a great time, but he he purposefully just tortured me before my before my shot. Oh uh, yeah, uh, in in good fun. I mean, I, I love right. it. Uh, but uh, so, well, this has been great. I don't want to keep you any longer. This has been great having you on here. I think this was a lot of good information for anybody who uh, who wants to uh, listen in on this. Um, again, uh, Seth is the author of An Actor's Companion. There's a newer edition. Uh, yeah. in the link for how to buy it on Amazon will be up in the chat. And uh, before we go, uh, I do want to let people know that next week, uh, again, an earlier edition of this at one o'clock Pacific, four o'clock Eastern. I will have Attila Salle on the show. Uh, he's a, an incredible cinematographer. I've worked with him on Get Shorty and on Aquarius. He also worked on Mayans MC and Justified, as well as countless other television, excuse me, television shows and movies. Um, Please subscribe to this channel, Matthew Arkin Studio, and when you do, ring the bell icon. Click on the bell icon so you get notifications of upcoming live streams and uh, videos that I post. And also subscribe to my newsletter at MatthewArkinStudio.com. The link for the subscription will be in the, the description below uh, this. And also join me Wednesday night, uh, 7 Pacific, 10 Eastern, uh, I'm hoping you'll be there, Seth, to watch and throw in snarky comments uh, for a new series that I'm starting with my younger brother, Anthony Arkin. Uh, we are doing a new series called Two Brothers Talk About Food and Movies. Uh, so two guys who grew up loving food and movies, grew up in the industry, watching a movie every week. Uh, we won't be watching it on the episode. We will have watched it and we will be discussing it and food and anything else and answering any questions that people throw our way. So again, uh, Seth, thank you so much for coming in. This was my, my absolute pleasure. And uh, by the way, I just realized that another way to get the book that will be easier for people to remember is barrowgroup.org. That oh, will, that's probably much easier than barrowgroup.org. Okay. Yeah. I will. I'll put that in the uh, description instead of the Amazon link yeah. and, uh, and people and will get it through there. Thanks so much for having me on. It's always a pleasure uh, hanging with you. And uh, I hope, you know, I hope people enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Yeah. It's been great catching up with you. Yeah. All right. I will talk to you soon. Okay, man. Be Thanks. well. Bye-bye.